Man, the pressure is on. Got I got to preach with Rip in the house. Oh, I know. It'd be good. You know, it's first of all, it's good being with you here this morning. And I know my better half is not here with me today. That's who you really care to see is Julie. <laughs> when she's not here, our grandson uh, had a baseball tournament, and so she was being grandma. And at the tournament early this morning, uh, she had to be in Taylor at eight o'clock this morning. So she's really being grandma uh, this morning uh, with that. But before we get started, let's pray uh, because you need to hear from God. You don't need to hear from Philip at all. So uh, let's pray. Father, I just want to come to you this morning. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house, the opportunity to be here, to worship you, to hear from you, to to be able to be in fellowship with other believers. And Father, I pray that you would prepare our hearts to hear what it is you have for us this morning. I pray that you would get Philip completely out of the way so that your words are spoken this morning, not mine. And Father, we thank you for what you're gonna do in each and every one of our lives. And it's in your name we pray, amen. You know, a lot of times we, especially as Christians, we will throw out this phrase, uh, we either hear it or, or we're, we're putting it out there. And the phrase is this, let go and let God. We, we say that quite a bit. And, and, and it's true. We need to let go and let God. We, it is true that we need to do that. And we say that often to people. We just tell people, oh, you just need to let go, brother. You just need to let go, let God handle it. And we say that until we're on the other end of that. And then when we're on the, on the other end of that, it's, oh, hang on now. Uh, that let go God thing is, is kind of hard. It's kind of tough because the let go part is, means I have to let go of it all and just hand it over to God. I have to totally release everything and say, God, it's all you. And, but you and I, we like to have our hands on things. We like to be involved. We like to be able to touch it and, and, and hold it and, and be able to speak to it and, and, and fix stuff. We like to get our hands greasy and dirty. And so it's hard for us to let go and let God. But the crazy thing is, scriptures are full of all these promises that God has for us. And he says some pretty wild and crazy things in the Bible when it comes to this. And so here's, and, and today there's, the title is going to be Let Go, Let God. But there's going to be a whole bunch of different scriptures we we'll look at. So there's just not one scripture. So the first one we're going to look at is 1 John 5, 14. It says this, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So right off the bat, the first promise we got from God is like, hey, I hear you. I hear you. Which that's what most wives ask of their husbands. Hey, do you hear me? <laughs> and the second scripture is Mark 11, 22 through 24. He says this, have faith in God. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw itself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's a hard scripture to swallow. Because Jesus is telling us, if you just believe, if you just believe, there's great things. You can tell a mountain to move and it will be done if you just believe. Matthew 7, 7 says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. You see, when we let go and let God, when we don't let go and let God, when we don't, what it reveals is that you and I we, we have some unbelief and we have some doubt inside of us. So Matthew 17, 20 says, 
Jesus speaking to his disciples and he tells them, he says, you don't have enough faith. Jesus told him. He says, I tell you the truth, if you have faith even the size of a small mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. There is nothing impossible for you and I, according to God's word. Matthew 13, 54 through 58 says this. We have, we have here the story here of, of, of Jesus in his, in his hometown. And it says here that, that he could not do many mighty works because of what? Because of their unbelief. Jesus is in his hometown. You know he wants to do great things there. You know he wants to heal people. He wants to cast out demons. He wants to re restore sight. He wants to do all these miraculous things in his hometown. But yet he can't because of their unbelief. And a lot of times, you and I, we kind of handcuff Jesus from doing great things in our lives because of our unbelief. And unbelief is basically this, is believing something other than what God has said about a situation. Believing something other than what God has said about a situation. A lot of times, this will happen, and, and we'll know God says this, but we'll go, yeah, but. Yeah, but, you know, that was, that, that's Old Testament, or, or that's back, you know, that's back, you know, Jesus way back when, that's back, back then, you know. You didn't have the internet then. You didn't have Twitter. You didn't have Instagram. You didn't have all this other stuff. You know, you, you just don't understand. Yeah, but. Jesus, you didn't live in the cancel culture society like we do today. Yeah, but. I mean, we just throw out all this stuff when it comes to it. You see, here's the crazy thing is that you and I, we can believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. We can believe that he is our Lord. We can believe that he's coming back soon. But if we don't believe and do what he says, <laughs> then you and I, we are operating in an area of unbelief and doubt. You see, it truly is possible for a person to believe in Jesus, but still not believe what he says. Hebrews 13, 12 tells us that we need to check our hearts. We need to take a, we need to take a heart inspection. We need to check our hearts. It says, be careful then, your brothers and sisters, Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, turning away from the living God. So why is believing and having that lack of death, why is that belief, why is it so important to us? Well, Mark 9, 23 tells us, and I, and I, love, I love how Jesus responded here and because what he says here in Mark 9, 23, he says, what do you mean if I, if I can? And I think Jesus, if it was Philip, it would have been with some attitude. <laughs> because it would have been, I, I would, I mean, I would have said, what do you mean? I was like, hello, didn't you see me walk on water? Didn't you see that blind man that I touched and now you can see? Hey, uh, don't forget about, you know, Lazarus or, you know, my guy, he was dead. I brought him back to life. And if that's not enough, hey, how about that party I threw at the wedding? You know, there was water, and now we had five, the best of wine. What do you mean, if I can? It's like, hello? Jesus says anything is possible for the person that believes. Because if you can believe, all things are possible then the unbelief and the doubt and the fear will disappear. And that is exactly where God wants you and I to live. He wants us to live in the realm of what is possible with Him and through Him alone. And you see, that's what sets believers apart from this lost and dying world is that we believe, we believe 
You see, when you put all of your trust in God, not in yourself, not in the systems of the world, it's like you're a tree planted by this nice, cool, bubbling stream. And you're just able to grow and blossom because you're connected to the source of life. And you're planted in fertile ground. So no matter what situation comes your way, you're able to just grow through it and become even stronger and stronger. See, circumstances will be no match for, for what you're going through. They won't be overwhelming when you trust in God, when you believe in Him. So in order to overcome, we need to understand how. How do we overcome? How do we overcome our doubt? And how do we live in a realm, a realm that, that is so real and, and, and has so much possibility in for it, has so many promises for us? How do we live there the way God wants us to live? How do we do that? There's a couple of things that I want to talk about. And the first one is this. We are to know God. We are to know God. We are to know His will. You see, that the reason it's so important to know God, to have that relationship with God, that I know that I know that I know, is that ignorance is the devil's playground. And he knows that if he can keep you from knowing all, all the stuff that, that belongs to you, that God has for you, if he can keep you from knowing all that, keep you ignorant of knowing that, that he has you. I believe there's so many of us that when we finally get to heaven, that we're going to stand there and we're going to see all the promises and all the things that God wanted to give us. But yet, we never receive them because of unbelief. There's so much more that he has for every single one of us. And, and not only ourselves, but our, our the church. There's so much more that he has. So much more. But I believe we get caught up in being ignorant and knowing God and knowing his, his will for ourselves. See, because a lack of knowledge results in unbelief. A lack of knowledge results in unbelief. And the devil is right there to take advantage of that. You know, telling you that you're that you're sick, telling you that you're broke, that you're depressed, that you're that you're a failure. He's right there to take advantage of it. And all it is is a lack of knowledge. And Satan takes that and he twists it and he turns it into something that's that's ugly and it pulls you back, pulls you down. I mean, just look at Eve. How it just takes it and just twists it, those little things. Lack of knowledge. But here's a great thing. Satan is overruled. When you, have, when you know the Word of God and you have the Word of God, that overrules. That, that takes precedence. If you know it, then as soon as you begin to see it, you can claim what, what God says and you get to object with what Satan's trying to say to you and, and do with you. And if we, if we don't have that knowledge, if we don't, what happens is we begin to buy what the devil is selling. We begin to buy. Just like Eve bought. Just like our world is buying today. Just like many churches are buying today. I, I just read not long ago that a church in Houston had, had, a, had a, a drag queen party in their, in their church. And they're celebrating. And, 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 all, and so they're buying. And it's because of a lack of knowledge of God's word and having that, that, that understanding of what he's saying and what he has for us. See, the thing is, I believe so many Christians today, and, I, and even churches today, they become casual with God's Word. 
do they begin to, to think, well, I, I've been in Sunday school all my life. I, I, I you know, I've read, I've read the Bible. You know, I, I have a morning quiet time where I, I read some scriptures. Uh, you know, and they become lax. They become casual with God's word, just thinking that I know it all already. I know it all. And see, when you become casual, when you slack off in it, that's when the devil's sitting there just waiting. And he's ready to steal you blind. Yes, I've read this book several times. Cover, cover. Read it every day. And there's still scriptures that jump off this page and, and slap me in the head. Even though I may have it highlighted and underlined and everything else, but it's like the very first time I've ever seen it. And you see, this, you, you can't become lax and, and, and lazy and our understanding of scriptures. This has to be something that we study every day. And, and not just read it, but just read it, but also study it with like, God, show me. Show me what I need from this. How, how does this apply to me today? How can I take this and, and, and put it in my life? What do you want for me? What, do you, what are you showing me? It, it is a constantly, every single day, diving into and, and, and learning. It is it is not a, you know, okay, I, I, I read, you know, 2 Kings chapter 13. All right, I read that today. Check that off my list. No, that's casual. That's casual Christianity. And Satan loves that. He loves for you to just read your Bible and be casual about it. Because, man, he knows he can get you. He knows he can get you and steal you blind. And that's what happened. I mean, this is exactly what happened to the disciples. When they were going out and they were casting demons, and they came up to the child and they couldn't cast the demon out of the child. And they felt they felt defeated. It's like, you know, they felt like, you know, hey, look, I've been in I've been in church. I never miss a Sunday. I go on mission trips. I do all this other stuff. And now here's this, and we we couldn't do it. And they felt like, you know, they felt like losers. And so they asked Jesus, why? Why? Why could I not cast out, cast, why could we cast this demon out? And Jesus told them in Matthew 17. Jesus said, he says, because of your unbelief. Because of your unbelief. Yeah, you read the scriptures. Yeah, you went to Sunday school. Yeah, you did those things. But you have unbelief in you. Because you got lazy. You just thought you knew it all. You thought you were all of that. And when you start thinking you're all of that, that's when unbelief and doubt is able to creep into your life. It's unbelief. They have forgotten what Jesus has told them earlier. Jesus told them, hey, I give you all the power. I'm giving you all the power that you need. But they still had unbelief. And we're just like the disciples because Jesus has told us the exact same thing. You see, in order to get rid of the unbelief in our lives, we got to get rid of certain phrases. We need to get rid of the what if phrase. We need to get rid of the yeah but phrase. And then we need to get rid of the one phrase that a lot of Christians like to say all the time. Yeah, but if, but if it be thy will, if it's thy will, then, then oh yeah, if it's thy will. It's like, no, we need to get rid of those phrases. We need to get rid of that, what I like to call, stinking thinking. We need to get rid of that. We need to get into the Word of God until your hope gets all nice and crispy, like you know, like a good old piece of bacon, nice and crispy. Your hope gets all crispy and your expectancy gets so strong that you're so excited and you're, you're just fired up and you can't wait to begin because you know the glory of God has come. You know that He's moving. You know you have these promises you can count on. You can take it to the bank and you have it. And, and you're so excited and you just can't wait to see what God's going to do every single day. Like you can't wait when you wake up in the morning. It's like, thank you, Jesus. I'm awake. I can't wait. I don't need caffeine. Because I woke up. That means you got something for me today. 
That means you have a word for me today. That means you have something for me to do today because I woke up. We should be that excited and that expected every single day and not get lazy, not get lax. And then the second thing is, in order to overcome unbelief and doubt, and I believe this is probably the biggest thing that we face today, not only personally, but in, our, in, in church life as well, in the church today, and it is rejecting fear. Rejecting fear. And you've heard me preach on this, one, this verse before, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. And it says this, don't worry. Don't worry about anything. I mean, we have the word of God. We have Jesus telling us, don't worry about anything. Don't worry. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. And then thank him for all that he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. See, the basis of all unbelief, the basis of all unbelief and fear is fear. The, the basis of all that is fear. Of unbelief and doubt, the basis of it is fear. I know what you said, but I know, I know you, you tell me this in the scriptures, but it's fear. Because you see, you and I, if we can't see it, smell it, taste it, and touch it, we doubt. We doubt. We have fear. And the crazy thing is, God has given you such a mind a powerful, powerful mind. He has given you an imagination. Do you know that if you see it and believe it, it becomes? This device right here was in somebody's imagination at one time. And now it's reality. Do you know that the Wright brothers, their uncle was a pastor of a church, and their, pa and their uncle told them, because they had a, a dream of flying, their uncle told them, you're going to rot in hell for such evil and demonic thoughts. <laughs> they were bicycle mechanics. And now we can fly anywhere in the world in just a matter of hours. The radio frequencies that went out, I think it's Marcon, when he was discussing that and talking about that and everything, you know, they put him in a mental institution and they locked him up. Because they said, you are crazy. And they locked him up in a mental institution. Your mind is an incredible, powerful thing. And, and, and it's in our imagination. But when we have those pictures, we have those visions of wanting to do stuff, whether it's in our lives, we want to maybe start a business or do something, or we want to go on a mission trip, or we want to be able to do something. Or maybe we want to start tithing. Man, when you start talking that, all of a sudden fear jumps in. We're in a recession, the economy, I can't afford it. And, and, and all this fear comes in. You see, and what that is, is this big fancy word called paradigm. We have stuff in our lives, and we try to get here, we want to get here, and as soon as we start getting there, all of a sudden these old thoughts, these old things start hitting us, and we come back down again. And that's fear. That's fear. Here's the other thing. When you begin to fear, if you don't deal with it, if you don't deal with that, it will begin to work in your mind. You'll begin thinking that you can't, it's impossible. And then you'll begin to question the Word of God. You'll begin having those doubts. And did you know this? Did you know it's impossible to worry and trust God at the same time? You can't do it. You can't sit here and worry and trust God at the same time. They go against each other. Because worry is a form of unbelief. 
So you can't sit here and believe in God and sit here all worried. You can't do the, you can't do them both. Because worry is a form of unbelief. And unbelief it causes you to doubt God's love. And I doubt his ability to come through when we need him the most. Fear will keep you from the promises of God. Even if you know what they are. And I believe a lot of us, we know the promises of God. But yet we struggle. We struggle in our personal lives, our families, our churches, our church lives. We struggle because of fear. The Israelites know something about fear. They could not enter into the promised land because of unbelief. Not because God didn't want them there. Not, not because they were, they were so unworthy. Not because he was trying to teach them something. It was because of their unbelief. The people who saw Moses come into town who saw the, the, the plagues, who, who saw the Egyptians releasing them, and they, and they go out, who come to the Red Sea, the Red Sea parts, they're walking through on dry land, and they're looking at the walls of water, and they're saying, hey, there's a good fishing spot, and they're seeing all this stuff. And then they get to the other side, and then they see the walls of water collapse upon the army that's chasing them to take them back. And then they're in the wilderness and they're being fed every day. Water coming from rocks. And they're seeing all this stuff. They're seeing it. But yet, they have unbelief. Because what did God tell them? God said, look, rise up. Just rise up and go take the land. It is there for you. It's there for you. I'm giving it to you. Just rise up. Just go. I just need you to get up and start walking. It is there for you. I've already taken care of it. It's, it's handled. It's a done deal. I've already signed the, the receipt. The deed is yours. It's closed. We're done. Here's the keys. Just walk over and go. It's yours. But what did they say? They said, oh, no, no, God. No. Mm -mm. There, there's some big people over there. I mean, there, there's some big boys over there. I mean, God, didn't you, don't you see? There's some big guys over there. I mean, they're big. They're tall. They're big. They're, they're all muscled up. I mean, God, we look like grasshoppers compared to them. No. Uh -uh. We're not going. We're not going. And he said, I've already done it all. You just got to go. See, the only antidote to fear is to believe. And faith cancels out fear. So when a situation comes your way that you could invite fear into, you need to make the decision that no matter what happens, you will refuse to fear. You know my story. You know, 10 years ago, I was told I had cancer. Mm -hmm. I had stage four cancer. I could have very easily gone into the fear mode and gone, I'm going to die. Very easily gone in. And nobody would have questioned me. Nobody, nobody would have, would have Setting A, it would have been just, yeah, they would just accept it. But no. If you go back and watch any of my videos of when I was going through cancer, it was I was excited, I was fired up. And I told people I was excited and fired up. When I, my head was shaved and I looked like garbage because of chemo, people asked me, how do you feel? And that's, that's probably in hindsight, that's probably a stupid question to ask somebody when they're going through chemo. Hey, how are you feeling today? <laughs> but I would always tell them, I feel awesome. I'm excited. I feel awesome. I feel awesome. It's a great day. 
and people just couldn't understand how can you be so upbeat you know, so, you know you have stage four cancer how can you because i knew this <clears throat> i knew that jesus was going to heal me he was either he's going to heal me and leave me here on this earth or he's going to heal me and i'm going to be with him but either way it was a win for me and i'm like no i'm not going to fear i'm not going to have doubts and, and now looking back on that if i had to go back in time and relive life and I could have the choice, cancer or no cancer, I would choose cancer every single time. That was the best time in my life and, and my growth and in my relationship with Jesus. It, it was that Jesus had his chair sitting next to me every single moment, and it was just like we were best buddy, and have, I could put my arm, I mean, it was, he was right, he was so real. There was just no way, I would never give that up. No fear. Faith cancels out fear. And here's the thing. When a situation does come, when it does come, and we're, you're going to have it, I'm going to have it, that we can easily invite fear in. We've got to make the decision not to. Not to allow. We have to refuse it. And if we do mess up, and, and, and we will, when we do mess up and we speak fear, when we speak doubt, what we need to do is we need to repent. We need to repent. We need to get rid of that stinking thinking. And here's the most important thing. Don't allow the, um, the words of unbelief be the last thing, word in the situation. Don't allow that to happen. Don't allow that last word of unbelief to come out of your mouth. Don't let the yell buts, if onlys, come out. Don't let that. And if it is the last word, stop, catch yourself and say no. I'm not believing that. I'm believing what God says. I'm trusting what he says. I'm trusting, I'm leaning in on his word and what he says. I am not going to allow unbelief. I'm not going to allow those negative words, that stinking thinking, to be the last thing that comes out of my mouth. And if I can't, if I can't get there, then I'm not going to go to bed until I can get there. I, I, I'll do whatever I have to do to get myself pumped up, to get myself back into God. <coughs> I'm believing you. I'm trusting you. See, you can overcome unbelief. You can. <coughs> you just gotta let go and let God. Because you see, when you know God's will, <coughs> when you know Him, and you believe it with no doubt, when you refuse fear and you receive all of God's love and all of his promises that he has for you, you will overcome. You will overcome the doubt. You will overcome the unbelief. Just remember John 10.10 10 tells us that the thief, his purpose is to come and to steal and to kill and destroy. But you got to remember God's promise. Jesus said, my purpose, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. God's purpose for you is to have a rich and satisfying life. And Jeremiah 29, 11 tells us, for God, for God says, it's where I know the plans I have for you. God tells you and I, he says, I know the plans. I've written the plans for your life. When I created you, I wrote a book. And here's the plans. Here's the manual for your life. It is all laid out. It is, it is fail-proof. These are plans, and, these, and God says these are plans that are good. These are good, good plans. And they're not for disaster. They are to give you a hope and to give you a future. God has great things for you and for me. As individuals, as a church, he has great things in store for us. We just have to believe. We just have to let go. 
and let God. Let's pray. Father, I come to you this morning. Lord, confessing to you that I struggle. There's times that I struggle. There's times that I have doubt. There's times that I've let fear come into my life. But Lord, I am so thankful for your promises. I am so thankful that you love me so much that even though I have had doubt and I've had had fear, you've helped me overcome it. And Father, I pray for all of us in this room this morning. <laughs> Father, we've all had those moments of doubt and fear. We've all had those unbeliefs. And Father, I pray that you would help every single one of us here today to be able to walk out of this building. Father, to walk with a bounce in our steps. Because we know you and we're counting on your promises and, and your promises that you, you tell us that you have for us, that we just have faith the size of a mustard seed. If we just believe that, that all things are possible, and Father, we would begin to, to believe it. We began to say it. We began to do it. We began to dream dreams, Father, of just everything that you have for every single one of us. The Lord, the world would look at us and go, you don't make any sense. Because we believe in you and we trust your word. And Father, I pray that not only would you do it in the life of each individual here, but Father, do it in the life of this church. Do it in the life of all the churches, Lord. That we would see a rise in churches, Lord, that are rising up. And Father, and just being bold, being bold on the promises of God. Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing here, for what you're doing in our lives. And we thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for all the great things you have in store for us that are, that are just lining up, that, that we are just like the Israelites. You're telling us, I just need you to go. It's already done, just go. Father, may we not be lazy, may we not be casual, may we not get lax, but Lord, may we persevere, and may we go with endurance and strength into what you have for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.